and uh, thanks for the invitation. Thank you to you guys for uh, uh, for you know just continuing with the the idea here because it, it seemed like it wasn't going to happen so many times. So uh, uh, good to be here. Good to see you all. Particularly nice for me to see Dick and Rose uh, Dowser on screen, uh, who. Um, I wanted to say old friends, but that doesn't seem appropriate. Um, and have been very influential in my Christian life since my youth. They probably won't thank me for saying that, but they have, and it's true. So uh, particularly nice to see them uh, uh, this afternoon with us. So let me try and share my slides here, folks. Um, hopefully you can see those, can you? Yep, perfect. Um, and uh, really, what I, I want to talk about today is uh, is just kind of uh, the idea that um, uh, lament is not something that we can pass off as uh, cultural, um, but uh, rather that lament is a biblical imperative. Um, and if we fail to lament in some way, it will have a, a detrimental our, our spirituality as individuals and as uh, and as uh, a people of God. Let me let me start by sharing a story with you. Um, back in the day, I, I worked for uh, IFES for the student movement, the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students in uh, in Poland uh, in the 1990s. And uh, while I was out there, uh, you know, one of my uh, one of my friends was the head of the. Uh, KFS, the, the student movement in Denmark. Uh, his name was Leif Anderson. Uh, Leif, uh, uh, Leif was uh, he was a theologian, and uh, I remember meeting him at a conference one time, and he was just going through a truly awful, one of these truly awful periods of life. Uh, his uh, his wife had been diagnosed with cancer. Um, his his son, who was who was quite a, a promising young athlete uh, at that time in his early teens. Uh, was di diagnosed with a form of dwarfism um, and his daughter who was only six at the time uh, was uh, diagnosed with uh, progressive macular degeneration which um, which would ultimately leave her blind uh, and these events all happened within uh, within a period literally of a of a few months um, life uh, was a theologian uh, and uh, uh, is a theologian who wrote uh, a book in response to these traumas that he and his family had uh, had experienced at that time. <clears throat> and he entitled the book, Lord, Why Do You Sleep? And the response from the church was one of uh, shock and horror. How dare you? Uh, entitle a, a, a book in, in that manner. How dare he, uh, you know, cast dispersions in God's good character uh, in that way. And the interesting thing was that these, um, uh, uh, these responses were only partly ameliorated um, uh, when, uh, when life pointed out that the title of this book was a direct quote from scripture, that it, that, that it came from, uh, from Psalm 44. Even then, uh, some of the church leaders who responded negatively, they weren't quite willing, uh, uh, they weren't quite willing to let it go and they wanted to find a way uh, to explain away this, uh, uh, this awkward text uh, from scripture. Uh, and, that, that response really leads me to the, the kind of argument that I want to unpack today. Um, lament is not just a cultural phenomenon that was appropriate to the ancient world, but not today, that kind of you know then but not now uh, attitude. Neither is lament something that can be passed over as, uh, as a phenomenon that's appropriate to the Middle East. Uh, or as you sometimes hear with a degree of cultural arrogance, something that's uh, appropriate in the in the, the the developing world, but but not in the developed uh, world, uh, the the kind of so there, but not not here. Uh, neither of these uh, arguments are in any way persuasive. So the large swathes of the biblical literature are made up of lament. 
there are more laments uh, uh, in the Book of Psalms than, than any other genre. I know genre classification is a slippery subject, but um, but I think we can agree that there are more laments than any other single type of uh, uh, of um, psalm in the Psalter. You've got large chunks of uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah prophetic texts that are taken up with lament. You've got the Book of Job, Job, which is an extended lament, lamentations, and so on. Um, large swathes of the biblical literature um, are, are taken up with lament. Jesus models lament for us in the Gospels, and um, and lament is meaningfully present in the New Testament as well uh, as in the Old. So, the argument that I really want to develop today is that um, biblical that, that lament is a biblical imperative. Uh, and it's one that we cannot ignore or marginalize by passing it off as um, either historical or cultural. Uh, and when we do minimalize lament, we do detriment to our relationship with God. And we actually, we're kind of copping out the world. We, we actually do harm uh, to the world in which we live uh, by, by not lamenting because it impacts our prayers. And uh, we believe that uh, our prayers, uh, God's response to our prayers impact this world in which we live. Um, in order to make that argument, the first thing that we need to realize is that lament is, is not just about venting. It's not just about the expression of sorrow. Uh, it's not just... Uh, cathartic, uh, you know, it's not just a bold expression of uh, loss and pain. Now, in some ways, it, it is all of these things, but it's not limited to these things. We, you know, we have a lot of, in Scotland here, we have a, a lot of um, uh, pipe tunes that are laments, and they're, they're just really sad and really sorrowful. And I think that's what a lot of people in the church uh, associate with lament, the expression of sadness or the expression of sorrow. But it is more than that. If we're to understand how the dynamic of lament works and how the dynamic of lament should work, we have to realize that lament is grounded in the idea of covenant complaint. These are formal complaints um, from God's people addressed to God. Um, uh, in that sense, what we're doing is we're effectively saying to God that he is not keeping his side of the covenant relationship. He is not keeping his side of, um, uh, of the covenant deal um, in that sense. Now, there are a number of staggering thoughts in there. I appreciate that, folks, but bear with me here. It's a staggering thought that the creator God, who, who you know, is completely sovereign, uh, he, he deigns to enter into a covenant relationship. He, 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 he chooses to bind himself to relate to us in a particular way. That in itself is, is a staggering thought. But not only that, he lays upon us the expectation that if we perceive injustice in the, in the world which he has created, in this good but fallen world that he has created, if we perceive injustice, then he lays upon us, uh, he charges us with the responsibility to bring formal covenant complaint to him uh, about these uh, injustices that uh, that we see in the world. Now, that, that, that's an argument that you might want me to uh, to develop more fully. You probably don't right enough, but you might want me to remember uh, to uh, elaborate more fully from the scriptures. But all I would challenge you to do is to read through some of the, the laments. They are so thoroughly grounded in covenant language that it is unmistakable. Uh, and the, 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 the starting point for a right understanding uh, of lament and its role within our lives as individuals and within the church is this realization that it's based in covenant. It is, it's profoundly grounded in um, the, the, the covenant relationship. So we are bringing formal covenant complaints to God. But I hear you say, 
little lamb, chasto, as the, the, as the, the, the Hebrew has it here. I put this in Hebrew because I, I couldn't fit the English in the, on the slides here. Um, that beautiful economy of, uh, of Hebrew poetics here. Um, uh, his steadfast love endures forever. Uh, how, how do we deal with that problem? So, I mean, a lament is effectively bringing covenant complaints to God. And yet we know that God is always faithful to his covenant. Uh, we know that his steadfast love, his covenant love endures forever. And we have it here, uh, I'm cited from Psalm 100, but, you know, in, in Psalm 136, every second line declares, little lamb has to. His steadfast love uh, endures forever. You know, probably the response uh, of the congregation, this antiphonal response of the congregation, God is good in all of these, uh, in all of these ways. So theologically, we know God um, to be faithful. Therefore, how can we possibly accuse him um, of covenant unfaithfulness? And I think for many of us, that's just, it's just, you know, it's a circle that can't be squared, isn't it? It's one of these things that we 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 cannot get beyond um, that sense of that which is theologically appropriate. Uh, we struggle to get beyond that sense that of, of what is theologically appropriate, quote unquote. Um, but the truth of the matter is that experientially, while we know that God is faithful, while we know that His steadfast love endures forever. It doesn't always feel that way, does it? Uh, and, and it doesn't always seem that way uh, when, we, when we look at the, the, the world around about us, if we're, gen genuinely, uh, if we're genuinely honest about it. I mean, you know, uh, as AJ and Dave were, were, were saying and praying as we started, you know, we, we, we look at the world in which we live uh, today and, and we think, you know, where is, where is God's justice in Bucha or in Mariupol? Um, I, I mean, that's, you know, that, that's just in Ukraine. There are so many places throughout the world. Where, where, where God's justice is, is, is very evidently uh, being denied in, in, in this world in which we live. So, so yes, uh, theologically, we know that God is always faithful, uh, and, and yet we're charged with bringing covenant complaints to him. And so in some sense, we know that the problem must lie with us, not with God. Uh, we know who God is, therefore the, the, the problem must lie with us and, uh, and not with him. But let me just say that, yet yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. But the fact that the problem lies with us is not a problem. Um, every, every prayer that we offer is perspectival. Every prayer that we offer is from, is from a human perspective, from a flawed human perspective. It's, it, so all of our prayers are skewed, one, because we're human, and two, because we're sinful humans. Um, so we, we do not see things from the divine perspective. We see things only from a human perspective. Um, uh, and so in that sense, even our most polite, even our most theologically appropriate prayers are flawed and skewed by our humanity. You see that, folks? You know, even our most proper prayers uh, are err uh, in one way um, uh, or, uh, or, or another. Uh, and so we shouldn't be worried uh, about erring when it comes to offering uh, laments um, uh, to God. All of our prayers are, are perspectival. And in that sense, the, the book of Psalms, it's perspectival literature. Uh, Nahum Sarna, uh, in uh, his very helpful little book, in the, uh, it's just called On the Book of Psalms, he describes the Psalms as the only book in the Bible which is theotropic. Uh, you know, it's Godward in direction. 
all of the rest of scripture, potentially with the, the exception, I guess we could say, of the, uh, of the wisdom literature, all of the rest of scripture is anthropotropic. God speaks to humanity. But here in the Psalms, we have, a, we have texts that are theotropic, human beings, flawed, fallible human beings speak to God. They address uh, God uh, in prayer, and yet, of course, uh, in this uh, you know this ma miraculous dynamic of uh, of, of uh, you know canonization, God takes these words uh, and makes these human words to Him, uh, and makes them scripture that uh, uh, that that speak that speaks to us. Uh, and so we shouldn't be too worried about that that the perspectival nature of our prayers when it comes to lament. Um, <clears throat> Because of course that uh, that 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 sense of our prayers being perspectival should give us great confidence as well. It should give us a great sense of security as well, because we pray, but God will respond as He sees fit. Uh, uh, let me quote uh, a short quote from from Sarna again here: In the Psalms, human beings reach out to God. The initiative is human. The language is human. We make an effort to communicate, he receives. He chooses to respond or not according to his inscrutable wisdom. He gives his assent or withholds it. And so, so yes, our covenant complaints are based in error on, on our part, but that's, that's not a problem. The onus is on us to pray honestly and as we see things in the confidence that God will always respond uh, appropriately. Which leads us, uh, it leads me on to my third point here, which is um, just this idea that we see in the scriptures of the, the psalmist's abhorrence of the lie. Um, uh, and the example that I, the worked example that I want to, us to think about to, today uh, is from Job, uh, Job chapter twenty-seven. You know the, these verses one to six, um, where, where Job point blank refuses, point blank refuses to accept the lie. So the the easiest thing in the world for Job w would just be to to agree with the friends, wouldn't it? You know, it, it would. I remember, I remember reading the book of Job. So I was, the first time I really read the, the, the book of Job, in essence, I was 14 years old. I, I became, you know, became a Christian at the age of 12 uh, at Scripture Union camp. And I was doing the thing that I was, you know, was kind of taught to do um, at, at that stage, you know, yeah, doing my quiet times, chapter a day. Um, reading through a, a, a chapter of books of the Bible. And, uh, and you know, I came to this point, I was, I was 14, I remember it clearly, and I thought, oh, well, I'd heard so much about the book of Job, but never really uh, delved into it. So, you know, I, I went after a chapter a day reading uh, the book of Job at the age of 14. And of course, by day 10, I didn't know which, day, which way was up. You know, I had no idea what was going on. Uh, you know, you read the Friends and well, you start off with this weirdness about heavenly assemblies and you're not quite clear about why Job's suffering in the first place. And, uh, and then you've got these friends and the, the friends, they, they sound so theologically right. Uh, and that, yeah, then you read Job and, and he sounds so right, but then the, the tone's quite, it's not what we're used to and all this. And I, I, I literally didn't know, I, I did not know uh, which way was up after 10 days. I mean, I pressed on till the end, but uh, I think Job was only one of these books that, 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 we, that we come to grapple with in the reading and the rereading uh, of the text. But the, the, the point is that the easiest thing in the world would have been for, for Job to say, yeah, you're right. The easy option would have been to say, yeah, there must be some hidden sin. Or, or perhaps this, this is a divine rebuke of some sort. Um, or perhaps this is a call for repentance. So all of the things that the friend suggests. That would have been the easiest thing in the world. Uh, and yet Job just cannot stomach the possibility of offering God a lie in prayer. Can he? Uh, we see it time and time again throughout um, uh, the, the, the speech cycles, culminating in these, uh, these verses in chapter 27, 1 to 6 of, uh, of, chapter, uh, uh, of chapter 27. 
because Job knows that a lie, uh, just, you know, giving in to his friends, yeah, okay, it might have made the book a lot shorter, but it would be a misrepresentation of reality, and it would also be a misrepresentation of the character of God. Uh, and the essence of the issue, folks, of course, is that no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how theologically appropriate it is, a lie is still a lie, is it not? If we are angry with God, or if we are disappointed with God, or if we are just plain lost in the events of the world around about us, do you think that God does not see that? So offering a prayer that is polite, offering a prayer that is uh, that is culturally acceptable, uh, offering a prayer that seems theologically appropriate, is nonetheless offering a lie to the God um, who who sees our hearts. Not only is that kind of pointless. Um, uh, and just plain stupid, let's be honest, folks. Um, but it also um, uh, it also kind of besmirches God's character uh, because effectively what we're saying uh, to God is that uh, that He is a God whom we cannot approach in all honesty. Uh, that He is the, the the type of God where we have to cover up what we really, really think uh, or really feel before, uh, before coming to him. So it's, it, it's not just pointless, it, it's actually a theological slur um, when, uh, uh, when you think about it. It's a sign that we don't genuinely believe uh, in a, a real functional two-way uh, covenant uh, relationship with God. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the, the reality of Job's lament is there are lots of things that he gets wrong. I mean, effectively throughout the book, he accuses, uh, he accuses Yahweh of having lost control of his life and, 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 and withdrawn from friendship uh, with him. You know, so that, that's his constant refrain throughout the speech cycles. And of course, he's wrong in both counts. He's wrong on both counts, and yet when we get to the end of the book, Job is commended by God because he spoke to God rightly. Uh, and of course, uh, most of our translations say that he spoke about God rightly, um, but I think that's a, that's a mistranslation there. The, the Hebrew is debar and el, which almost universally means speaking to God. So Job is commended at the end of the book because he, as the only human participant in the book, he, he alone was the one that spoke to God rather than speaking about God. And so he's commended for that role as lamenter. He's commended um, as intercessor. And of course, he's given the role of intercessor. He has to intercede um, on, behalf of his, uh, on behalf of his friends. So affirming, God, God affirming at the end that Job's attitude, although he was wrong in fact, Although his perspectives were skewed, Job did the right thing. And I think that's the lesson um, that, 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 that we in the church in the West have not learned uh, and really desperately, um, uh, desperately need uh, to learn. And, and that leads me to um, my, my fourth and final point here. This is... Um, uh, this is an area that I'm still working on. There's uh, a, a, an article that I'm um, in the process of writing. Oh, gosh. I very nearly told you who the, the article's for a festrift. And I very nearly told you who the festrift was for, but, but said individual doesn't know that there's going to be a festrift. I, I, and I, I fear that some of you may know him or her. Um, so I'll not say, but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, this article for a, an upcoming festival, um, the, 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 the argument I want to make here is this, what we see um, 
Uh, we see it particularly in Psalm 73, is the, the, the contrast between Asaph uh, in Psalm 73 and the, the, the arrogant. Um, and so, you know, we, it, Psalm 73, it's kind of the only worked example of a lament, isn't it? So we have the lament in the first part of the psalm, very forceful, very direct, very accusatory. You know, uh, uh, verse three, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the shalom uh, of the wicked. I mean, talk about a theological hand grenade, folks. You know, uh, you can imagine the scenario. Hey, gather around, folks. I've, I've, I've written a new psalm. You're going to love this one. And it all starts so well. You know, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And then you get to verse three. I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the shalom of the wicked. Are you mad? Uh, the wicked, the, 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 the arrogant can't have shalom. They don't have shalom. So a really forceful lament on Asaph's part here and the psalmist's part here. But I think it's meant to be read in contrast with the, um, the attitude of the arrogant uh, in the first part of the psalm. And what do we see? Verse 8, speaking of the arrogant. They scoff and speak with malice loftily. Um, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues strut through the earth. Um, and then verse 11, and they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Now, you've got another of, a number of other Psalms where you've got these, these kind of um, uh, apparently atheistic uh, comments in the uh, in the Psalter, Psalm 10, 14, 36, 42, 53, and 94 um, are probably the clearest examples. There are others, but interestingly, to, to one degree or another, these are all laments. And I think in all of these, Sam, the lamenter is being cast in counter distinction to those who doubt the reality of God. And, and, and the slightly uncomfortable argument that I want to make here, folks, is that uh, you and I uh, and your churches and my churches, if we don't lament, then we fall into a, a, a kind of functional atheism. That's the contrast here. We either lament or we don't really believe in a God who works in history. We either approach God in all honesty or we, we don't really expect God to, to intervene uh, in, in, in this world, in our reality. Obviously, I'm not, talking about, uh, I'm not talking about an ontological atheism. I'm not saying you'll cease to believe that God exists, but a functional atheism, God might exist. God may even do things over there and for other people but he does not work in my reality. I do not expect him to work uh, in my reality. And I think that is the, 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 the net effect of the refusal to lament. We don't really, we don't really actively believe in, uh, in an interventionist God. That's the risk that we run. And that's why I would say that this is a biblical imperative that we have to follow rather than something that can be passed off as historical or cultural. The second aspect of this, this, this question of, um, uh, uh, of a functional atheism it is, of course, that it, that lament allows us, and this is, I'm finishing with this, sorry, I know I've just gone over my 25 minutes, Steve, forgive me, um, uh, uh, that it, it, lament allows us to maintain uh, an active relationship with God, even when we face disappointments in life. Very briefly, uh, of course, with the book of Job, the jeopardy is resolved by the end of chapter two. So the, the, the question is, is Job going to curse God and die? By the end of chapter two, we know that he is not going to do that. We know that he's not going to curse, curse, uh, uh, curse God and, uh, and die. The rest of the book, the lengthy, vociferous lament is all about how Job 
is able to maintain relationship with God uh, despite the, the the circumstances that he uh, he faces. And I think if we reject the practice of lament, uh, then we we run the risk of, of lo losing that 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 kind of vibrant sense of um, you know, just a life-affirming covenant uh, relationship with God. If we genuinely believe, as the Psalms tell us, that the Lord reigns and his love endures forever, then that will encourage us to pray honestly in every circumstances, believing that these prayers do in fact change the world. I'm done.